An article written by Sir John Hicks, the Nobel laureate in 1972. His paper in Econometrica in 1937, titled Mr. Keynes and the Classics, A Suggested Interpretation. It will be admitted by the least charitable reader that the entertainment value of Mr. Keynes' general theory of employment is considerably enhanced by its stat, uh, satiric aspect. But it, it is also clear that many readers have been left very bewildered by his danciad, distanciad. Even if they are con convinced by Mr. Keynes' argument and humbly acknowledge themselves to have been classical economists in the past, they find it hard to remember that they believed in their unrege uh, unregenerate days the things Mr. Keynes says they believed. And there are, no doubt, others who find their historic doubts a stumbling block, which prevents them from getting as much illumination from the positive theory as they might otherwise have got. One of the main reasons for this situation is undoubtedly to be found in the fact that Mr. Keynes takes as typical of classical economics the latter later writings of Professor Pigou, particularly the theory of unemployment. Now, the theory of unemployment is a fairly new book and an exceedingly difficult book, so that it is safe to say that it has not yet made much impression on the ordinary teaching of economics. To most people, its doctrines seem quite as strange and novel as the doctrines of Mr. Keynes himself, so that to be told that he has believed these things himself leaves the ordinary economist quite bewildered. For example, Mr. Pigou's theory runs to a quite amazing extent in real terms. Not only is his theory, a theory of real wages and um, unemployment, but numbers of problems which anyone else would have preferred to investigate in money terms are investigated by Professor Pigou in terms of wage goods. The ordinary classical economist has no part in this tour de force. For, uh, but if on behalf of the ordinary classical economist, we declare that he would have preferred to investigate many of those problems in money terms. Mr. Keynes will reply that there is no classical theory of money, wages, and unemployment. It is quite true that such a theory cannot easily be found in the textbooks. But this is only because most of the textbooks were written at a time when general changes in money wages in a closed system did not present an important problem. There can be little doubt that most economists have thought that they had a pretty fair idea of what the relation between money wages and employment actually was. In these circumstances, it seems worthwhile to try to construct a typical classical theory built on an earlier and cruder model that, than Professor Pigou's. If we can construct such a theory and show that it does give results which have in fact been commonly taken for granted, but which do not agree with Mr. Keynes' conclusions, then we shall at least have a satisfactory basis of comparison. We may hope to be able to isolate Mr. Keynes' innovations and so to discover what are the real issues in dispute. Since our purpose is comparison, I shall try to set out my typical classical theory in a form similar to that in which Mr. Keynes set out his own theory, and I shall leave out of account all secondary uh, compl complications which do not bear closely upon this special question in hand. Thus I assume that I am dealing with a short period in which the quantity of 
physical equipment of all kinds available can be taken as fixed. I assume homogeneous labor. I assume further that depreciation can be neglected so that the output of investment goods corresponds to new investment. This is a dangerous simplification, but the important issue raised by Mr. Keynes in his chapter on user cost are irrelevant for our purposes. Let us begin by assuming that W, the rate of money wages per hand, head, can be taken as given. Let XY be the outputs of investment goods and consumption goods, respectively, N sub X and N sub Y, be the numbers of men employed in produ producing them. Since the amount of physical equipment uh, specialized to each industry is given, x equals f sub x of n sub x and y equals f sub x of y n sub y where f sub x and f sub y are given functions let big m be the given quantity of money it is desired to determine n sub x and n sub y first the price level of investment goods their marginal cost w of d big n sub x of dx and their price level of consumption goods their marginal cost um w of d n sub y divided by dy first derivative of n sub y uh with respect to y right income earned uh, in investment trades value of investment or simply investment should be equal to wx of uh, first derivative of n sub x with respect to x call this ix income earned in consumption trades wy of uh, first derivative of n sub y with respect to y total income should be equal to wx plus wy call this i i sub x is therefore a given function of n sub x i of n sub x and n sub y once i and i sub x are determined n sub x and n sub y can be determined now let us assume the Cam uh, Cambridge quantity equation that there is some definite relation between income and the demand for money then approximately and apart from the fact that the demand for money can depend not only upon total income but also upon its distribution between people with relatively large and relatively small demands for balances we can write big m should be equal to k times i as soon as k is given total income is therefore determined in order to demand uh, determine i sub x we need two equations one tells us that the amount of investment looked at as demand for capital depends upon the rate of interest i sub x should be equal to c of i this is what becomes the marginal efficiency of capital schedule in mr kane's work further investment should be equal to saving and saving depends upon the rate of interest and if you like income therefore i sub x should be equal to s big s of i comma big i since here uh, since however income is already determined we do not need to bother about inserting income here unless we choose taking them as a system however we have three fundamental equations big m should be equal to k times i i sub x should be equal to c of i and big i sub x should be equal to big s of i and big i to determine three unknowns big i i sub x and small i 
as we have found earlier, n sub x and n sub y can be determined from i and i sub x. Total employment, n sub x plus n sub y, is therefore determined. Let us consider some properties of this system. It follows directly from the first equation that as soon as k and m are given, i is completely determined. That is to say, total income depends directly upon the quantity of money. Total employment, however, is not necessarily determined at once from income, since it will usually depend on some extent, to some extent, upon the proportion of income saved, and thus upon the way production is divided between investment and consumption goods trades. If it so happened that the elasticity of supply were the same in each of these trades, then a shifting of demand between them would produce compensating movements in big S of sub n, x, and n sub y, and consequently no change in total employment. On increase in the de inducement in, to, its, to investment, i.e. a rightward movement of the schedule of the marginal efficiency of capital, which we have written as big C of I, will tend to raise the rate of interest and so to affect saving. If the amount of saving rises, the amount of investment will rise too. Labor will be employed more in the investment trades, less in the consumption trades. This will increase total employment if the elasticity of supply in the investment trades is greater than that in the consumption good trades. Diminish if vice versa. In, uh, an increase in the supply of money will necessarily raise total income for people, will increase their spending and lending until, uh, until incomes have risen sufficiently to restore K to its former level. The rise in income will tend to increase employment, both in making consumption goods and in making investment goods. The total effect on employment depends upon the ratio between the expansions of these industries, and that depends upon the proportion of their increased incomes which people desire to save, which also governs the rate of interest. So far, we have assumed the rate of money wages to be given, but so long as we assume that K is independent of the level of wages, there is no difficulty about this problem either. A rise in the rate of money, wages, will necessarily diminish employment and a raise in uh, real wages. For an unchanged money in income cannot continue to buy an unchanged quantity of goods at a high price level. And unless the price level rises, the prices of goods will not cover their marginal costs. There must therefore be a fall in employment. As employment falls, marginal cost in terms of labor will diminish and therefore real wages rise. Since a change in money wages is always accompanied by a change in real wages in the same direction, if not in the same proportion, no harm will be done and some advantage will perhaps be secured if one prefers to work in terms of real wages. Naturally, most classical economists have taken this line. I think it'll be, uh, I, I, it'll be agreed that we have here a quite reasonably consistent theory, and a theory which is also consistent with the pronouncement of a recognizable group of economists. Admittedly, it fo follows from the theories that you may be able to increase employment by direct inflation. But whether or not you decide to favor that policy still depends upon your judgment about the probable reaction on wages. And also in a national area, upon your views about the international standard.
Historically, this theory de descends from Ricardo, though it is not actually Ricardian. It is probably more or less the theory that has that was held by Marshall. But with Marshall, it was already beginning to be qualified in the important ways. In important ways. His successors have qualified it still further. What Mr. Keynes has done is to lay enormous emphasis on the qualifications so that they almost blot out the original theory. Let us follow out this process of development. In order to elucidate the relation between Mr. Keynes and the classics, we have invented little apparatus. It does not appear that we have exhausted the use of, uses of that apparatus, so let us conclude by giving it a little run on its own. With that apparatus at our disposal, we are no longer obliged to make certain simplifications which Mr. Keynes makes in his exposition. We can reinsert the missing I in the third equation and allow for any possible effect of the rate of interest upon saving. And what is much more important, we can call in question the sole dependence of in investment upon the rate of interest, which looks rather suspicious in the second equation. Mathematical elegance would suggest that we ought to have i and small i in all three equations if the theory is to be really general. Why not have them there like this? m equal to L of big I and small i, I sub x equal to big C of big I and small i, and I sub x being equal to big S of i and small i. Once we raise the question of income in the second equation, it is clear that it has a very good claim to be inserted. Mr. Keynes is, in fact, only enabled to leave it out at all plausibility by his device of measuring everything in wage units, which means that he allows for changes in the marginal efficiency of capital schedule, which there is a change in the level of money wages, but that other changes in income are deemed not to affect the curve, or at least not in the same immediate manner. But why draw this distinction? Surely, there is every reason to suppose that an increase in the demand for consumers' good, goods arising from an increase in employment will often direct stimul uh, stimulate an increase in investment, at least as soon as an expectation develops that the increased demand will continue. If this is so, we ought to conclude big I in the second equation, though it must be confessed that the effect of big I on the marginal efficiency of capital will be fitful and irregular. The generalized uh, general theory can be, can then be set out in this way. Assume first, uh, assume first of all, a given total money income. Draw a curve CC showing the marginal efficiency of capital in money terms. At that given income, a curve SS showing the supply curve of saving at that given income, figure three, their intersection will determine the rate of interest, which makes savings equal to investment at that level of income. This we may call the investment rate. If income rises, the curve SS will move to the right, probably. CC will move to the right too. If SS moves more than CC, the investment rate of interest will fall. If CC more than SS, it will rise. The, how much it rises and falls, however, depends on the elasticities of the CC and SS curves. The IS curve, drawn on a, a separate diagram, now shows the relation between income and the corresponding investment rate of interest. It has to be confronted, as in our earlier constructions, 
with an LL curve showing the relation between income and the money rate of interest. Only we can now generalize our LL curve a little. Instead of assuming, as before, that the supply of money is given, we can assume that there is a given monetary system. That up to a point, but only up to a point, monetary authorities will prefer to create new money rather than allow interest rates to rise. Such a generalized LL curve will then slope upwards only gradually. The elasticity of the curve depending on the elasticity of the monetary system. In the ordinary monetary sense, ISLM. As before, income and interest are determined where the ISN LL curves intersect, where the investment rate of interest equals the money rate. Any change in the inducement to invest or the propensity to consume will shift the IS curve. Any change in liquidity preference or monetary policy will shift the LL curve. If, as the result of such a change, the investment rate is raised above the money rate, income will tend to rise. In the opposite case, income will tend to fall. The extent to which income rises or falls depends on the elasticities of the curves, since big C of i and small i should be equal to big S of i and small i, and the Derivative of big I with respect to small i should be equal to minus of this whole ugly term. All right. The savings investment market will not be stable unless partial S of partial I plus minus partial C of partial I is positive. I think we may assume that this condition is fulfilled if partial s of partial i is positive, partial c of partial i is negative, and partial s of partial big i and partial c of partial big i positive, the most probable state of affairs, we can say that the is curve will be more elastic, the uh, more elastic. Mm. When generalized in this way, Mr. Keynes theory begins to look very like weak cells. This is, of course, hardly, of course, hardly surprising. There is indeed one special case where it fits Wicksell's construction up absolutely. If there is full employment in the sense that any rise in income immediately calls forth a rise in money wage rates, then it is possible that CC and SS curves may be moved to the right to exactly the same extent so that IS is horizontal. I say possible because it is not unlikely. In fact, that the rise in the wage level may create a presumption that wages will rise again later on. If so, CC will probably be shifted more than SS so that IS will be upward sloping. However, that may be. If IS is horizontal, we do have a perfectly Wixian, uh, Wixellian construction. The investment rate becomes Wixell's natural rate. For in this case, it may be thought of as determined by real causes. If there is a perfectly elastic monetary system and the money rate is fixed below the natural rate, there is cumulative inflation. Cumulative deflation if it is fixed above. This, however, is now seen to be only one special case. We can use our construction to harbor much wider possibilities. If there is a great deal of unemployment, it is very likely that partial C of partial I will be <clears throat> quite small. In that case, IS can be relied upon to slope downwards. In this, the sort of slump economics will with which Mr. Keynes is largely concerned. But one cannot escape the impression that there may be 
other conditions where when expectations are tender, when a slight inflationary tendency lights them up very easily, then partial C of partial I, maybe large and an increase in income tend to raise the investment rate of interest. In these circumstances, the situation is unstable at any given money rate. It is only a an imper imperfectly elastic monetary system, a rising LL curve that can prevent the situation giving out the hand together, giving uh, getting out of hand together. These then are a few of the things we can get out of our skeleton apparatus. But even if it may claim to be slight extension of Mr. Keynes' similar skeleton, it remains a terribly rough and ready sort of affair. In particular, the concept of income, it worked monstrously hard. Most of our curves are not really determinate unless something is set about the distribution of income as well as its magnitude. Indeed, what they express is something like a relation between the price system and the system of interest rates. And you cannot get that into a curve. Further, all sorts of questions about depreciation have been neglected and all sorts of questions about the timing of the processes, processes under consideration. Thanks for listening.